Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. While he, while he dismissed the crowd, and after he taken leave of them, he went up, to, he went up on the mountain to pray. And even came the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw all that they were making headway painfully, for the wind wa was that w that they were that was against them. And above the fourth watch of the night he came, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass them. But when he saw when, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a, a ghost, and they cried out, for, for they, they all saw him, and they were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them. And the, and the wind keased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. <coughs> No? Alive, somewhere awake. Don't pull out your pillows yet, okay? I brought a prop with me today. This right here is a jar of sand. We're going to get to this later, but I guarantee you, if you pull out your pillow, you'll get to it a lot sooner. I did play baseball, and I can hit the back row from here. I promise. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you guys remember, last week we were focused on Mark 6. And we were talking about three things we learned from Jesus in Mark 6. Well, I, I did really have an hour-long sermon last week, so I split it into two to spare you guys. So this week we're going to cover three more points, or three more things that we learned from Jesus in Mark 6. The first one of these that I want to talk about is Jesus teaches us, or Jesus says, to help those who are in need. Okay? If you, if you brought your Bibles with you, I hope you did, let's open them up to Mark 6, and we're going to, we're going to start... In verse 53, we're going to work backwards today. If you brought your Bibles, Mark 6, I'm going to start in verse 53. Open them up there. And I'll start reading verse 53 through 56. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gesneret, and more, <coughs> excuse me, and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran, out the whole, and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds and wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, and, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. And Jesus teaches us right here Put a finger in there. We're going to mark that because we're going to come back. But Jesus teaches us here that he's reaching out to the sick. He cares about the sick. He cares about who's really sick because he allowed them to touch his garments. He didn't have to take that time. I think of when I read this, I thought of the woman that had bled for a long time, for years and years, and she touches his garment and he stops and turns and talks to her. He talks to her. He takes time to minister to these people. He didn't just ambly walk by, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. Even though that maybe that's the, kind of the way it sounds here in Mark. But we have example after example after example in the Bible of where he would heal somebody and he would take time to talk to them and to minister to them. Now, I always give you the million dollar question, but I'm not going to give it to you this early in the sermon. This is the $500,000 question. Do you take time to help those that are in need like Jesus did? Do you take time out of your life to help those that are in need? How many of you, by a show of hands, if you saw a car accident alongside the road, how many of you would stop to help out? Help the people that were in the car accident? My two firefighters don't raise their hand. That's kind of weird. You guys are kind of weirding me out there. 
How many of you saw a really bad accident? Maybe the people were unconscious in the car. Would stop and help take care of the car accident. Okay? We're pretty good Christians. We want to help people, right? If you guys will remember, back in January or December, I preached and I asked you guys about doing something for your neighbor. You guys remember that? I know I'm pulling up total recall here. How many of you will shovel your neighbor's driveway or did shovel your neighbor's driveway? Good. Good. Because people are in need. That's a need. It's a basic need and sometimes we overlook it, but people are in need. And that's what Jesus is about, reaching out to people where they have a need. As we try to be more and more like Jesus, we become less and less like ourselves. Amen? Now, the second point that I got out of this for today was, Jesus says not to be afraid. Let's take a look. Let's go back to verse 49. Verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astonished. Okay, well, here they are. The tempest is raging, and the disciples are freaking out on the boat again. Right? I mean, here they are. We talked about this back in, in Mark 4. Here they are in the boat again, and the winds are blowing, the seas are crashing over the bow of the boat, and they're freaking out. Oh my gosh, there's a ghost out there on the water. What are we going to do? It's the end of times again. Now, you guys remember, we preached on this, or I talked to you guys about this a couple weeks ago. My wife remembered that when she was reviewing my sermon notes. And she said, you already talked about this. You don't need to talk about it again. And I said, hold on just a second. You are really, really smart compared to me. I know you are. But, Jesus talks about it twice. Mark put it in the book twice. I'm going to talk about it twice too. If the disciples didn't get it, I'm betting we didn't get it either. What do you think? How many of you guys remember that sermon about three weeks ago? Yeah, Larry and I. How about that? That's interesting. <laughs> hmm, thank you, brother. <laughs> How many of you remember doing this? How many of you remember writing your greatest fear on a piece of paper, tearing it up, and putting it into the collection plate to be thrown away forever? Now you guys remember the sermon, don't you? How many of you were able to do that? How many of you were able to tear up that piece of paper? How are you doing with that? Are you still holding on to that fear? Did you pull it back out after you tore it up and gave it to God? Are you still holding that fear close to your heart? Sometimes we need to hear the story twice to get the impact, don't we? I brought a video today to share with you guys. As we watch the video, let's take a look at ourselves. Think about ourselves. And think about why we don't want to give up that fear. Why we don't want to give up to God and let Him be in control. Greg? I can't read my paper, Greg. Flip on the light. <laughs> getting too old. We, we want to hold on to our fears in life, don't we? We want to hold on to those things in which hold us back. We want to hold on to the excuses. We want to hold on to the sin that dwells inside of us, don't we? It's not the way God created us. That's not what He says, but that's what we want to do. Why do we struggle with trusting God? Why do we struggle with putting our faith in Him? Sometimes I think it's because maybe we don't understand. That brings me to my third point. Jesus says we don't have to understand. Jesus says it's okay 
to not understand. Let's look back at our Bibles one more time. Verse 51. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Jesus doesn't give up on the disciples right now, does he? If that was me getting back in the boat, I think I'd turn the boat upside down and drown each one of them and go find 12 new ones. You're not getting it. This is the second time we've talked about fear. Why aren't you understanding? Those are the things I want to say. But not Jesus. He says it's okay to not understand. He says it's okay. We're going to move forward from here. We like to laugh at these disciples sometimes because they didn't understand. Oh, ha ha, you know, we have the book. We see the whole picture. We know how it ends. So we're given something they didn't have. But we like to look back at them and say, you didn't get it. You didn't understand. And I understand better than you. But realistically, we don't understand either, do we? Sometimes it's really hard for us to understand. I want to take a survey. A raise of hands. Everybody involved here. Everybody wake up. Involvement. Okay? How many of us in here, by a show of hands, 100% of the time, understand everything God is doing in our lives? 100% of the time. No hands. Okay, I'll make it simpler. Guys only, okay? How many of you guys understand your wives? Show of hands. You guys understand enough that you don't want to sleep on the couch. I'll make it even simpler. How many of us in the room can say we truly understand how a computer works? And I'm not talking, I understand I flip on the power switch and it comes on. I'm saying you actually understand some of the technical aspects, the mechanics behind it. Raise, raise your hand, Jesse and Jared. I know you guys can raise your hands. There's a few other people that can do it. You guys actually understand. So we finally get some hands up. But see, like the computer, we don't have to understand how the computer works to know that it works, right? Right? I don't have to understand that there's an infrared beam inside my remote control that turns my TV on and turns my stereo up or down to know that it does it. Right? I don't have to understand how a GPS connects with satellites up in space to understand that the GPS can get me from here to the grocery store. Do I? I don't have to understand those things to accept them in my life. And I don't have to understand what God's doing to know that He is real and to know that He is alive, that He is awake, and He is ever-present in my life. I don't have to understand God to see His fingerprint here on earth, do I? I don't have to fully understand everything about God to know that He is here, that He did design this, that He did send His Son to save me, do I? Because that in itself lacks understanding. We've talked about that over and over again. I would not give up one of my children for any person in this room. He gave up His Son for everybody in this room and everybody outside the four walls. We don't have to understand to know God. Back to the dirt. The sand. This is ordinary sand. I dug it up in the backyard. It's ordinary sand. What do you see? Not yet, Greg. Not yet. You're ruining my punchline. What do you see when you look at this jar of sand? Brown, tan, granules. Jesse over there probably sees a mixture of silica and different aggregates, but he's smarter than us. <laughs> it's dirt. That's what I see. I see dirt. Nothing more than dirt. How many of you see dirt? When it gets on your kids, you've got to wash it off. It gets tracked inside the house, you've got to sweep it or vacuum it, right? It's dirt. Greg, show the slide. That's dirt. 
magnified 250 times. And you tell me how you understand a God that would take the time to carve out each one of those pieces of sand. Does that make any logical sense whatsoever? That he would take the time to make those crystal structures, to make the little animals that make those little seashell structures, to group different groups of sand together to make one little rock. Does that make any sense to us whatsoever? How many grains of sand do you think are in this jar? How many grains of sand are there in the world? And yet he takes the time to carve them out and make them each the way he wants. And we sit back and say, I struggle with trusting God because he's not powerful enough. He's not alive enough. He's not in my life right now. How can we say God can't carve us into being what He wants us to be when He can carve sand that we can't even count because the number's so high? I had a discussion earlier this week with Jesse and a few other brothers. We were talking about the speed of light. And it's 182,000 miles per second, right? Did I get it right? 182,000 miles per second. And I propose the question, what happens at 182,001? And they said, well, that's where Einstein's theory of relativity comes in. We don't really know. Because we can't possibly measure anything that fast. I propose that at 182,001 is where God begins. That's where speed for God begins. That's where he's starting, outside of our understanding. Why is it? Why is it that we struggle with trusting God? Why is it that we struggle trusting a God who would carve out that sand, who would carve out our lives and make us individuals? How is it that we struggle? with trusting a God that is in control of everything, that is faster than the speed of light, yet slower than the smallest animal, slower than the smallest measurement of speed. He is all things to all people. How can we not give up that fear? Jesus tells me He will take care of me. He tells me I don't have to understand I just have to trust. I just have to trust in the Lord, my God. We're going to get ready to sing that song here in a minute. Caleb, why don't you come on up? I just have to trust in the Lord, my God. That's all I have to do. I have to trust in the Lord, my God, that sent His Savior, Jesus Christ, to save me, to save you, and to save the world. I have to trust the Lord, my God. Amen? The Lord, my God, that created not just this earth and the gazillion pieces of sand on it, but He created the universe and the gazillion stars that are in it. He created a world for us to live in, to share the gospel message of His Son. Amen? He created His Son to die on a cross for us. Amen? Amen? I don't have to trust in not understanding. I have to trust in the Lord my God.